Welcome to the Escapart Podcast. My name is Stuart Burrell, and thank you for listening. To celebrate the launch of our ebook available through www.escapart.co.uk relating to pan rolling, pan bending, pan shaping, depending on how you call what you choose to call it, uh, I want to actually recount uh, one of the stories that isn't featured in the book. So consider this uh, an optional extra if you want to learn how to bend a frying pan, how to roll it, how to make it the ideal gift for a newlywed or someone you don't really like, uh, then I recommend the ebook. It's got some wonderful routines in there if you're a performer and it should give you some inspiration on how you may be able to segue that or similar effects into your own close-up routines, be they magic, be they coin, be they card or be they escapology. So another plug, one more time, that's www.escapart.co.uk. It's in the shop. Uh, also, very big plug for our colleagues over on Buzzsprout for letting us uh, broadcast once again, and also on Stitcher, as well as those of you listening in on YouTube. Thank you all for the time, thank you all for the miles, and thank you for the bandwidth. As ever, the Escapart podcast is purely just a place for my thoughts and a place for my voice. It is nothing more than an opinion. You may disagree with it, and you're entitled to disagree with it. It is a free country, it is a free planet. So please, if you have a, con- if you have a contrary opinion, please share it in the comment section, please email me. I'm happy to get into a conversation with you, and, and I'll be civil. If you want to be civil with me, I will be civil back. But first, back to on topic. We were talking about frying pan rolling. And there's a couple of stories in the ebook, but I wanted to just tell you uh, a recent story. And it was about rolling a frying pan for the first time. And it, this wasn't somewhere or something I had done with great fanfare. It was something that I just wanted to try and see if I could do. I had seen it on video, I would heard of tutorials, but I wanted to see if I could do it for me. And that's that personal challenge. So this is purely personal it's not something that's in the ebook but the first time i did it i found a very low cost pan and the reason for that is simple i haven't got a lot of money equally i wanted to see if i could do it so i went to a particular branded store in the uk and i acquired an aluminium or aluminum depending where you are in the world frying pan And then, quietly, when no one was looking, uh, especially my long-suffering wife, I uh, set about figuring out how to hold the pan and how to turn it and how to twist it. And I eventually turned it into a tube. Now, you may think, well, we kind of know you can do that because you've written a book on it. But pause for a second. You're taking something ordinary and doing something extraordinary with it. And that is the very premise of magic. And that's what went through my mind as the metal was giving way, as it was turning, as it was twisting, as it was manipulating. This was something that can appear magical. And also, it is something that inspires people. In the same view, the same look that you and I had the first time we saw a card trick. The first time you and I had when we saw someone get out of a straight jacket. That moment where you go, wow, for the first time. And that was that moment when I saw a pan being rolled. Because I could see how it linked to the art form I like. Because it tied in with so many things I'd done in my life. It was the first synthesis of a magical effect, a technique, a strength training methodology. Call it what you will. But it was exactly what I'd always ever always wanted to do without realising it. Now, the main story I wanted to bring was seeing that look in some other people's faces, seeing that sparkle in other people's eyes. And that took place last year at some local libraries. I was asked to come along as a world record holder, as someone who escapes from things. And I did this uh, just a few pennies. It was it was all about the fact that this was for 
people to encourage them to read, be they uh, be they people who, for whatever reason, the school system wasn't able to help them, or perhaps they were young children. It was just something a little bit different. And I came along to three local libraries, and the look on people's faces, because they turned up to see something different. They didn't. It wasn't a magic trick. I wasn't putting rabbits out of a hat. I wasn't making black cards way more than red cards. I was simply doing my thing, be it getting out of ropes, getting out of handcuffs. But the thing that stunned them wasn't the bending of an iron bar, wasn't uh, breaking cable ties with brute force. It was taking a frying pan and turning it into a tube. And I autographed it. And the parents were stunned. The parents were stunned. The children just loved it because here was something real. Here was something they only saw on TV or in comic books that had happened right in front of their eyes. And for the first time, they thought, oh, where did he learn to do that? And to turn around and say, well, it's in these books. Suddenly, you know, and a good two or three of the kids spent the rest of the day, apparently, nose deep in textbooks wanting to learn because suddenly they found out where the secret was they found out that okay Yoda wasn't available but somebody had been very kind and had written down a whole load of secrets in books and I'm not talking about exposure before people turn up and start getting angry and saying you're giving away secrets no I'm talking about the secrets to real life read the rules read a book be the first Remember the first time someone said, a rolling stone gathers no moss. Somebody created that phrase and put it in a book and put it in a play. And discovering that core, that you know, piece of literature, it could be Wind in the Willows, it could be The Count of Monte Cristo, it could be The Three Musketeers, or a Robin Hood story, or A Christmas Carol. But inspiring people to do something is what is a core to what I, why I do what I do. And if you don't inspire people, how can you be inspired yourself? Because it's a two-way process. When you see someone enjoy what you do, when you see someone enjoy the revelation of what you do, that's worth its weight in gold. And that's why I keep trying to do what I do. So that was the the, the real joyous story was uh, getting an opportunity to meet uh, a performer or two or several performers. I met uh, Sylvester McCoy, who was in The Hobbit. I met Stephen Williams, who played X in X Files. I met uh, Christopher Daniels. I met Kazavian, and I met the Dudley Boys. And this was at uh, a convention in Milton Keynes, which unfortunately isn't happening this year. So I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I didn't miss the opportunity. But to just to go out there and do something, you know, no fanfare, no pretense. Just go to the shop, grab a frying pan, bend it in front of the greatest tag team in professional wrestling history and not get thumped, not get beaten up by security, not get uh, insulted, was wonderful. And what happened next was even more inspiring. And one day I'll, one day I might put that in the book. But it has been, and it is, important to try and inspire people. The easiest thing in the world would be to say, no, that's not how you do escapology. That's not how you do weightlifting. Yeah, the easiest thing in the world is to be critical. And there are some people in magic clubs, I've encountered it, who turn around and will moan and bemoan and be critical and say, you're never going to amount to anything and just be so negative that it destroys you. And I've encountered that. I've encountered that where someone will just keep attacking and attacking you because you're doing a version of what they think is their their uh, their art but art is subjective 
and for every Monet there is a Damien Hirst. Both are equally insightful, both have their highs and low points, but both are artists and the art is big enough for differing views and I just hope that if you're hearing this and you have a differing view to me, we can have a conversation, maybe I'll learn something, maybe I'll learn the error of my ways. But equally, if you're just listening and you're going to disagree, that's open to you as well. A final point, the final plug, again, please tune in, please subscribe to YouTube. But also, first podcast I did, I spoke about copyright, and I played a wonderful piece of audio which is in public domain it's copyright free and it's harry houdini talking about his water torture cell but the interesting thing is when i uploaded it onto youtube we had a bit of a surprise because youtube runs an audio recognition software it's basically designed to stop people loading up music and not crediting the artist now what happened was uh, he, the software detected Harry Houdini's voice and what had happened was that audio track was used in a piece of jazz music just for background, just to place it into context and it was freeform jazz, it was very avant-garde but as far as YouTube were concerned I was using their music and it wasn't their music, it's a public domain piece of audio it's in the Library of Congress, it is free it is devoid of all copyright but according to the software it should actually be pub it should be recognized as being belonging to this music company now in defense of the music company in question they have several thousand artists working for them and they can't possibly check and verify each claim so i'm sitting here a bit bewildered why, why, why must I remove this track that is public domain? Or, why should I run an advert for a freeform jazz group which really has nothing to do with escapology? So a couple of emails were exchanged and very civilly they agreed that it's one of those things and as a result the matter was dealt with. And again, this brings us back to what we started off with. It's art it's open to interpretation and if you come in with a little grace you can leave with a bit of grace and I hope if you hear this and you can think about it and you can give me the time of day we can be graceful as an art if for whatever reason you've decided that what I do or how I present myself is in some way an affront to the very fabric of the universe then I apologise but I do hope we can have a discussion about it if we can't, then I'm going to be brutal. Perhaps that says more about you than it does about me. One more time, a final plug. The ebook is at www.escapart.co.uk. More versions will follow. There will be the republication of Ratcheted Restraints. I'm doing a book on picking padlocks called Picking Padlocks. I know I've got to work on the titles. And I just want to take this opportunity to thank you all for listening and hope that you'll tune in to Chapter 2 of The Master Mystery when it's published but also support your local escape artist wherever you are in the world. Whether you're in the US, there are some fantastic performers out there. And please, more information will be coming on the American Convention, the US Convention, I'm sure. Please support that. It's vital for the continued development of the art that we don't allow opportunities like that to pass us by to not be supported and thank you for your time thank you for listening uh, we've got the United Kingdom Escape Artist Convention meeting coming up in the next few weeks uh, about one month's time and I will be reporting back on that and obviously I'll be reporting on the, some of the things I'm going to take up there hopefully surprise some people with so if you're going to the UKA uh, spoiler alert and if you're not at the UKA but you're based in the UK get in contact uh, we're on Facebook we have websites 
but if you have any other questions just contact me and I'll happily point you in the right direction uh, you could be starting off in escapes you could be a veteran and in either case I will be my usual polite and reverent self well thank you for listening my name is Stuart Bell and this has been the Escobar Podcast